this mean? Hmm? Main, main thing is 16 or 17. Which we look 16 or 17? Uh, I think it's, uh, yeah, I think it's 16. So, Petra. Yeah, got the name Petra. Yeah. Is it? I didn't realize that. No. External display the uh, ready already? Or do you need to um, it might, it may need configuring. I don't, I'm not sure. I just want to. I have some uh, problems with it. And I have to, if it's not working, you can run upstairs. Oh, here it is. Here so it is, but this is the next screen. Okay. This next it might this kick in when this comes when you start the presentation. When you start, it will be probably two two screens. Yeah, it'll be like give me yeah, something yeah. there. Yeah, this is cool. Yeah. yeah, and it works right from the couch. Yeah, even the rocks. Hello, good morning. Uh, my name is A.D. Burrows and uh, welcome to this presentation. Uh, currently, I'm actually working with cgmasters.net and creating Blender tutorials and stuff for them full time. But for the last five or six years, I've actually been working for TT Fusion, which is part of uh, TT Games, which is part of the Warner Brothers Interactive Entertainment Group, which basically uh, look after a lot of the um, uh, Lego franchise, you know, the, 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 the various games that you can see on there, basically. Now, what they use primarily is um, Maya and ZBrush, so, uh, it, it, but I found reason to be basically use uh, Blender in my particular workflow. And uh, so I'm going to basically look at some examples and so on for why that was. Uh, also, by large, I think I've would probably encourage all studios really to have Blender somewhere in their studios, and I'll go into that. So uh, basically, uh, why, 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 when I add uh, Maya and ZBrush, would I basically use uh, Blender? So the evolution of that, in fact, was uh, you know I would be using Blender in, while I was at work, and another artist would come over and they would say something like. Uh, Oh, you're using Blender, uh, and, and kind of uh, sympathetically shake their head as they walked away. And uh, maybe a little bit later on than that, they would be like, "Oh, this is this is looking interesting," um, which is, let's be honest, is only a slight step up. But then you get like uh, a little bit later on than that, you get more development going on, and people are like, "Oh, this is uh, what's this? Is this Modo?" And then a little bit after that, you would get um, basically the people would be like, "Ah, this is this is Blender. It's looking really cool." And uh, I want to download it. Will you show me how to do that? That's really going to speed things up and this kind of thing. So it kind of, you know, the question really is, you know, more why not than than anything else. So th that kind of worked out in in the end. So why was I actually using uh, Blender in the first place? Well, uh, back in the day, I was actually starting to think, well, I'll do some freelance stuff. I'll kind of get, I, you know, I know a few creative types, and we can do some cool creative projects and things like that, and maybe we'll make a little bit of money out of it. Uh, well, a little bit, you know. The, the, it was, so I tried to cost things up. I was thinking, well, okay, if I was setting up my own freelance thing, you know, what, what is that going to be? I had a few. I didn't really, I was a bit green at the time, so I didn't really know too much about what my options were software wise. I kind of knew, you know, Maya and all that kind of stuff. So I thought, well, you know, Photoshop is this much, you know, then you've got things like After Effects is going to be that much, then maybe something. 
something for audio, maybe Cubase, maybe Reaper, something like that. And I kind of costed it all up, thinking, okay, this is pretty reasonable, this is getting there. And then it kind of came to look at the price tag of Maya, and then it kind of like <laughs> sort of blew everything else out of the water, and it kind of made it a very unrealistic option. And so uh, I kind of thought to myself, oh, but also it was m way more money than I ex really expected to make. So uh, per, per year anyway, and, and, and I thought, well, uh, so it kind of makes it fairly redundant, you know. So I started shopping around for other 3D stuff, and I came to a cross blender, and that image could actually represent my mind when I came across blender, and it was like, how is this free? You know, and I'd, I'm sure a lot of the other uh, artists that I was speaking with in work about it were of a similar sort of mindset. So um, I took up blender and started to use it whenever I could, really. So. Back in the day, I wasn't too familiar. I was only just picking up Blender, but the studio at the time was looking at kind of uh, a new w workflow because the old workflow was basically you have uh, a designer would basically want it. You want to get to a block out stage of the game as quick as you can, really. And so the designer would be, uh, you know, they'd be looking at. Uh, you know, sketching something down on a piece of paper, they would hand that to the artist, the artist would block that out, they would export that into the level editor. They, they would then kind of get that game running in the engine, whatever the engine may be, and then the design would feed back to the artist about what they wanted to change, and then those changes would go in, then the designer would go in. There's a lot of back and forth, basically. This is looping around, it's not very economical or efficient. And so they wanted to change that. So uh, basically, what they were really looking for is some sort of new work flow and so the, the much more efficient so that was going to be more like uh, you know the designer should be able to do all that at themselves so they would should be able to block stuff out and then get that exported and then be able to make those changes themselves so at the time that was uh, as I say I wasn't really uh, able in a position to really push uh, Blender at that point but I would obviously push that now but what they went for at the time was Google SketchUp and uh, there are issues with that uh, because it was the free version. So um, that is procedural geometry. Now that is a good choice to make actually because it's very, very easy to use. It's very sort of, uh, you know, it works through pr booleans and so on for procedural geometry. So uh, that's kind of fairly straightforward. You can do that kind of stuff. But when you're trying to export out, you're basically using Collada in the free version. So it ends up being Axis uh, issues with the, uh, the information that you get out. You can then sort of switch it, but still you get these weird issues. And uh, the other part of that is that actually the license has now changed. So we're now basically, you know, you, you're going to be stuck with an old version now. So the Google sold it on a while, a while back to another company. So the, uh, it would be recommended to use Blender in their particular uh, instance anyway because Blender obviously is polygonal geometry so even if you are using um, uh, Maya or Max for that matter you, you're at least getting something which is on a par you know it's sort of also the designers are kind of learning transferable uh, skills as well so that and also they can kind of ask you know the from one software package to another it's kind of a lot of the same modeling principles apply so you know this is this is something that can be done fairly easily that's a worthwhile thing to look into really also you could obviously code your own exporter for it so you could basically export into their particular game engine or whatever the game might engine might end up being or you could of course just use the game engine for that prototype you can set up a little Lego minifig which is running around with the camera and then you can kind of uh, uh, get the perspective as soon as you, you're just pressing P basically and then before you know it you kind of go ah okay that actually is not going to work like that or you know we just get the units right you know you jump distances this kind of thing they're going to climb up walls that way you know you can prototype that sort of stuff out and the designer can get pretty far before then the artist is actually able to really get in and start doing it or of course you've got the FPS mode which is just a kind of you know, again, another key press, and you've then got another key for gravity, and then everything's been given instant collision. So that's pretty straightforward. So, you know, you can see the benefits there. But obviously, I'm not a designer, but I was still using Blender. So let's take a look at some more instances of that. So back in the day, one of the first times I started to use it was in LEGO City in, for that Wii U game. 
And uh, basically, this is, it's, you know, because a large city type, open world type kind of a game. And the, uh, you know, one of the, a few of the areas I worked on, one of them in particular was this sort of farm area. And uh, one of the first things, uh, that's just an example just to set that up, by the way, but the, the, we did all these interior levels as well. So this is kind of later on in the game where there's a uh, much more of a sort of uh, high-tech kind of laboratory type of an area. And in this particular example, uh, you can see these hazard stripes. You always get hazard stripes in games. So you get these things with uh, these sort of uh, beveled sort of edges on the side. You can see this sort of green frame. Now, basically, uh, that green frame, I thought, oh, this would look cool if it had something like that in it. But Maya, you might, you know, I don't know whether you're going to be that familiar with uh, other 3D packages, but Maya at the time, we were using 2011, and Maya didn't have an inset. So, you know, you don't know how lucky you are sometimes. But the, the so basically, it was very, very quick. OBJ into, into Blender, just grab the faces it needed, inset, did a little bit of the uh, shrink fatten tool, take that back out again. About 30 seconds later, you know, it's, it's in and I can carry on with the workflow. And then another instance is Solidify. You know, you don't have Solidify modifiers in uh, Maya. And this instance here, you can see this tunnel on the left. That's just geometry. Obviously, the faces that you can see in the tunnel are just sort of facing that way. So when you've got the sun lamp from the game engine sort of bearing down, you're going to need to block that light, otherwise the interior of the tunnel is going to be all brightly illuminated. So you're going to need to have something. But if you flip, just take that geometry and flip the faces, you might get this weird moiring effect where you get this weird sort of filtered uh, black and white effect as the engine doesn't quite know what to render. Like, should I let light in here? Because it's taking the same Z space. So you, you have uh, you want to be able to take that solidify modifier, basically, and you know this is just a, a brief example of that. That's the geometry for the same tunnel, and then you just apply the uh, solidify modifier to it. And if you don't know exactly what that distance should be, that's the beauty of a modifier. You can then just sort of, you know, get, kind of get it just right, and then kind of delete the faces you don't need, and then export out, and then you're right, and it's, now it's working, and then you carry on. So that's a point that I'm sort of driving home, really, is the fact that you know from Maya isn't a modifier modifier base and uh, Blender is. So you can get all these various different non-destructive ways of going about it. So looking at the far right that you've got there, that's the basic input mesh, if you like. You know, so in a game, you know, in an open world game type, you've got a lot of uh, thing, assets that are going to need to be created because it's absolutely huge. And uh, so rocks are going to be everywhere. So it's kind of nice to th think of like a little bit of a pipeline where uh, you can generate a lot of rocks and stuff like that. So this is kind of a, a standard technique, really, but it's, you can't really do it properly in, in Maya without buying external things and plugging all those things in. But, uh, but it's so straightforward in Blender as it is anyway. You know, so you just get your geometry. You know, you kind of uh, smooth it a little bit, maybe subdivision a surface modifier on there, and then you've got a various different displacement and noise modifiers, you know, that you, you're basically putting on there, different types of noise to generate the cracks, different levels of detail, and then at the end of it, you can then use that to bake onto the first mesh, and then it's that kind of, I mean, I don't think that's exactly the same thing that I'm using there, but as another example, then you just want to paint it, and by the way, Blender has some awesome 3D painting tools, which, uh, you know, uh, is really, really incredible. And so another example would be uh, the Lego Hobbit. This is not meant to be blown up that big. This is a 3DS screenshot, so please don't judge me too harshly on this one. But basically, that alpha texture that you can see, which is basically like a railing, um, that is essentially just using it. And it that's all done in Blender, so you've got like, I, that was a last minute decision. We, the, the, uh, this is the handheld version, so the, the console version was already written and made. And at that point, it was like, okay, so we have this level where, um, I think it's Bjorn is, is, is his name, is, and, and he's like, turns into a wolfman type thing in The Hobbit. And so he's barreling in through the doors, and you've kind of got to get to safety as quickly as possible. Uh, but they wanted his own gameplay on the roof of his house, which it doesn't feature in the console version. So there was no real proper geometry to use up there for that kind of stuff. So we needed to uh, kind of come up with something pretty sharpish. And I, we didn't really know what they were going to do with it. So were they going to be a, have a cut scene where the, the cameras would suddenly zoom right into those things? You know, you don't know really at that point. So I wanted to, some sort of foolproof kind of thing that I could do. So. 
with that, you can take, again, arrays, displacement modifiers, subdivision modifiers, bit of noise, render that out as an alpha, have that all set up, Z depth, normal, bake outs, lighting, change the light from there, get a little bit of shadow if you're going to bake that in, and all that kind of thing. And if at that point you realize it is going to get kind of far away, then you can kind of tone down those details. That's no big deal because there's no extra time in doing that. It's all very, very easily set up. So um, another example uh, from Lego Marvel, it, a, an incredible amount of, um, can you see this okay? Is that okay? It seems bright from my, my point of view. Uh, okay. Anyway, uh, yeah, so a lot of this level, this is from the console version, uh, which you've got like the next generation stuff now. So this is working into physically based shading now. So you have, um, uh, which is what the, they, they, uh, uh, TT have their own in-house engine, by the way. But so they've been doing the, uh, the physically based rendering is quite a popular thing right now, but they, they've been doing it for years anyway. But the, uh, what I was doing was I was taking a lot of that geometry is done in Blender. So you got the, uh, the girders, uh, the tread plating on the floors, the actual exterior, the blast hole that you can see in the back there. There's actually gunshots that go through there. That's actually very simple, but I had a very elaborate version at one point, which but you, you can't see. It's just shrunk right down now. And then uh, basically this, this is the interior of the Statue of Liberty. So you start very, very low down, and then you, uh, you enter through the foot, and then you go higher, and then this is kind of like midway. And as I say, most of that is done. Another cool thing in Blender is you've got renderable wires, you know, so it's so simple to just add some thickness to a, a wire, and uh, a, a curve, I should say, and then you've got you know, wires in a flash, and it's very, very easy to move. It kind of curves in Maya a little bit cumbersome, to say the least. You know, you have to rebuild the curve, and again, it's very, very satisfying, I find, to work with curves in Maya, so I do a lot of that, uh, sorry, curves in Blender, uh, excuse me, uh, so I find that very satisfying. Um, so a lot of that, the good is down the side, the wood planks are done in Blender, sculpted, modeled, UV'd, everything is, is done at that point. This is like a top down shot, so we're looking right down from the top of the level, right down, so as I say, all that wood there. Uh, that is an alpha grating there, similar to the previous slide in The Hobbit, same sort of process. Um, so that's kind of cool, sort of uh, looking in t inside like a, a typical uh, blend scene. You can see the, there's the girders that I'm talking about, really simple. Now the cool, again, Blender modifiers, very, really, really, really cool. You have the bevel modifier. So as you're baking out into normals, you don't necessarily know how actually detailed you're going to be able to see this stuff. So you don't know how much to make that bevel. Not a big deal. You can switch that uh, kind of on the fly in a modifier. That's kind of really easy. So you just kind of bake that out. Also, the really nice baking in uh, Blender anyway, and this is before you could do the cycles baking. So th that's, that's uh, really, really easy and pretty straightforward. You've got things like the tread plating. So I use arrays in that in instance. I, I mocked this up. This isn't the version that's in the game. That's uh, on, this, on the left, that's just the viewport. Uh, so you can see like a, in, the, in, in the middle of there, you've got like a, a little triple di uh, diamond type thing. And this is just using dupli faces instead. You know, so you've got the array, so you could just use that. So that you could just change one thing. And by the way, that's like an alpha bit. So you can treat different aspects of the texture differently. So you can really get complicated or as simple as you want. And, and in this sort of uh, age now, this next generation where you're getting into the Xbox One and the PS4 and that sort of stuff, and you want to be able to really go to town on your textures and things like that and the materials and the physically based shading and stuff like that. Having that level of control, that's a really beautiful thing to be able to uh, manage. Now another cool thing about Blender is that it can handle this kind of geometry pretty easily. That's not a wireframe. That is just the, uh, the, the, that is the, just all that geometry has is edges. It doesn't have any faces. Now this is the exterior shell of that Liberty, uh, the Statue of Liberty. And that was because we had the skin modifier and I was wondering whether I could use that for uh, kind of, you know, the sort of, uh, uh, riveted sort of structure support structures around the sides of the building. Uh, it didn't quite work out that well, so um, I didn't actually end up going that method. But you can see the bit that's highlighted. That's what I did end up using, and that's the curve to form modifier. So I just had a small piece, and then you can. That's again very very fluid. And if the geometry changes, and as it almost always does, somebody says, "Oh, pull that in a bit there." You know, that's not a big deal because that's kind of coming with it. You know, as you just put that bit. You know, obviously the the uh, cur the piece that is being deformed is coming with it, so that's no big deal. Again, uh, in the, you have those blast holes. Those uh, have them here. Use the solidify modifier again for that. Before the sort of other sides as the bits have been curled in. And by the way, when they've been curled in, this is something 
that this would pretty much make Maya crash if you tried this. You see how you have uh, that top edge selected at the top of that, I guess that's like a six. And then you have uh, I've set the pivot point to that, up, that, that sort of twist to uh, the 3D cursor, which is in the center there, as you can see by the gizmo. And then it's just set to rotate, and it's on proportional editing, so with a really high sort of threshold. And that's you can just bend that sort of right round. So that's kind of, and that, I say that to, uh, to sort of indicate you have those um, things that you're kind of rotating around. You know, the sort of blast that's coming through, you can sort of rotate in that around. So you want to, you don't necessarily want to rotate it at the top, you want to rotate it at the point where it meets the blast hole, and you kind of bring that in and they kind of fold it over itself. So you can see why, you know, you want that kind of action. But you try that a few times in Maya crashes a few times, it's not long till you basically think, hmm, let's get a blender open, fix this. <clears throat> so that's, that's me, you know, I, I, I'm, I, uh, you know, I'm using uh, Blender a lot for, for a lot of those different things. So as you can see in that level, I was particularly using Blender quite a lot. So. Why don't studios use Blender more? Well, there's two very, very good reasons, and this is just historical and sort of, uh, you know, this is just history at, at play, really. The, the you have already integrated in-house tools, which closely work. You've got shaders and things like that that are all sort of embedded heavily into the code, and it's basically just not worth it to uh, rejig all that kind of stuff. So uh, the other side of it is there's not really enough downtime. When you're a big studio and, um, you know, you've got big budget, big production, big turnaround times, hopefully big reward, all that kind of stuff. You, it tend, you tend to end up trying to squeeze as much as you can out of that. And so there's not really as much downtime as you would hope. So uh, you, you, there's, there's, you kind of have to have a bunch of designers, for example, want to do it in their own time if they want to try and start incorporating the Blender into it. Uh, besides that, there is um, a couple of other things, reasons that people might not use Blender. Um, one of them might be to do with, uh, again, just limited integration with stuff like, you know, you have the Substance Designer now, you have things like uh, ZBrush, which is, people like to kind of go between those applications quite quickly sometimes. But these are kind of all workaroundable issues, uh, and it's still very fixable. As, as I say, I was working in a physically based shaded environment, and I was still going back into within Blender all the time anyway. And, you know, where you have that and you have a texturing tool, you know, you've got everything you need really. Um, depending on the particular case, so, you know, this is kind of a generic, a lot of studios are different, so, you know, you have to bend the rules a little. Uh, the, so, as I say, they've got real-time physically based rendering and speaking to a few of the Blender guys, the developers, uh, it, that is in the future. So, that, again, that's probably not a, uh, an issue which is going to come up soon. This is a guy, uh, I don't really know how you say his name, Arioxini, I, I believe. Uh, I think he was doing the, um, uh, I think it was a uh, Mario uh, 3D World kind of uh, conversion kind of thing into the Blender game engine. Uh, anyway, he was doing some sort of uh, using the game engine as a PBR viewer, so that was kind of intriguing. So you know that it's not far from doing that, and it's probably not that far in Blender's distance at, uh, future anyway because of uh, the th viewport project, which I'm really excited about. So uh, on top of that, you have um, the growth. You have a lot of really good things happening in Blender. We've got the fact that you have kinds of um, uh, different sorts of levels of reputation. So you have digital tutors bringing it on board. I don't think they've necessarily done that much on Blender yet, but by them at least approaching that, that endorses the idea that they recognize that professional st studios need training, you know, that kind of thing. So also there's things like blend swap, which is, um, uh, you know, uh, if you're interested in how a model is put together, you can obviously r rip it apart, take it apart that way, understand, and then also use that as a building point. If you're a designer, for example, you want ready-made assets, that's an excellent place to start. Uh, you have pretty much a new version every day, which is not something you're going to get from other mainstream commercial softwares, uh, with updated bugs and so on. Obviously a little bit stable, even the official releases are rapidly turned around. So you have things like a really active uh, forums like Blender Artist Forum. An anecdote for that would be when I was using the Enhanced 3D cursor. I think it's, I don't know how you say the developer's name for that. It was Dayrin Zero D or something like that. Anyway, uh, thank you, Dayrin Zero D. Uh, the, basically, he, I reported an issue with that, and within about three hours, he'd fixed it, sorted it. Here's the link, and then it was going to, you know, that, that's. Uh, 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 
really puts a smile on your face when you kind of uh, need to get some, a job done and uh, you're still waiting for minor bugs to be fixed months in it after. So th th then you have things like the uh, stack exchange for all sorts. Actually, you know, modeling, you can ask a question on there. There seems to be some pretty good active uh, and also coding level uh, queries and conclusions and answers on that as well. You have uh, the Blender network, of course. So if you're a new studio and you're thinking, is this for me? You, know, you can't really have the excuse of, oh, I don't, I don't know. I don't know really what it's capable of. What it's going to do? Is it good for us? You know, obviously you can start making calls on, on people in uh, the network to basically fix that. Obviously, you have um, the Blender support crew as well, which is the like, that kind of if you need somebody on the end of a line you know you're going to be able to uh, call somebody and actually say look we've got these issues can you help us you know uh, that's from uh, Sebastian <laughs> yeah, so that's uh, you know you're going to get some good stuff there and then you have uh, the blender market of course so which is adding an uh, a, a, potential for commercial applications, maybe they, that gives them an, uh, an avenue in or some kind of road in for that. Um, and also the level of uh, interest in building even more professional tools obviously gets increased as well, that the, the, the uh, emerging options and abilities that you can do already on the blending market in, in addition to what Blender is, is obviously, you know, for that cost, even if you bought them all, you still a fraction of, uh, you know, whatever it might be for three, well, three and a half grand. So um, on top of that, you have, uh, you know, that's kind of making the assumption in a way that, oh, nobody's using uh, Blender to make games. And obviously people are, you know, making very good games and making very, very successful games. So you, I think it's often forgotten that obviously CG Cookie, not only do they do incredible training, they've got, you know, amazing, uh, they're actually a great production house. So they've uh, created their Eat Sheep game. You have Monument Valley, who was an incredibly successful game. Uh, with their main tool, I believe, was Blender for the art creation. And, uh, you know, in the, they, that's, I think Blender can very easily cope with that style as well, you know, this kind of illustrative style. On the other hand, you have more sort of... Um, uh, physically based styles. Now this is something that I'm working on at the moment which is just kind of where I, I wanted to do a project where it was like basically all the art was done in Blender and yet it still went to like a physically based engine at the end of it and was a decent little game, you know, just a very short sort of uh, arcade styled game so uh, I really wanted to sort of see what I could potentially do with that. And by the way you can follow along with the progress on that on cgmasters.net so I'll sort of keep updating what, how that's getting on. and. Uh, Really, that almost sums it up, but really just if little studios turn into big studios and it's, not a ma it's only a matter of time until it's clear that there's a lot of people out there using Blender, obviously the question does come up, who's using Blender, you know, what's the visibility, you know, so that endorsement and that kind of uh, level of sort of... Uh, uh, just the reputation in general, really, you know, that's kind of what we're, we're looking at doing. And if a, a large studio, maybe this is, starts off as a small studio, grows into a large studio, if only a fraction of their budget, which was, spe was spent on something else, went into, like, the Blender Fund, that would obviously fast-track a lot of features anyway. So uh, thanks a lot for listening. That's basically going to sum it up for me.
O, super. Te światła trzeba trochę przekreślić.